morning. Welcome to worship. We're still in the season of Easter. I know it probably seems like it's been ages, but we're still in the season of Easter with Pentecost quickly now approaching. I'm Bob Mosley, the pastor of Christ Church, where we seek to make connections and offer opportunities for faith, love, and service. We continue to try to embody this purpose as a community of faith in the midst of this challenging time, doing as much as we can remotely and online, which you can certainly see those on our website, our Facebook page, or our YouTube channel. There are things such as exploring Sunday scriptures on Tuesday, which is a time in which there's a little more in-depth uh, experience of looking at the scriptures that we hear as part of this worship experience. There is music and meditation on, excuse me, feasting on the word on Wednesday. Let me go in the order of the week here. Uh, that is a time in which you might call it sort of biblical yoga. We just take one passage and we hear it several times with some silence interspersed as well. Fridays, we have music and meditation, which is a Teze style worship. We'll be carrying that through up into uh, Pentecost. I'm not sure which of these experiences for you have been meaningful as we continue to look ahead at what we will continue to offer. So if there is things that you particularly look forward to and have found to be a great source of comfort at this time, I pray that you will email myself or the church, Janelle, in the church office and, and let me know which experience that is. In addition, let me offer a couple of other things. I know many people have been enjoying the time they're spending in their gardens, and we at church have gardens that also need attended to. So if you're looking to get out away from your house just a little bit and are willing to be here on your own and work in some of the church gardens, I would encourage and implore you to take that time. You need to bring your own tools and anything that you weed can just be put in the dumpster. But this is a little, a little garden of Eden that we can offer people. And there are so many people walking that I'm sure it would be very meaningful to have a church that looks very good on the outside. The other thing is I'm starting to explore the summer sermon series. Last summer, I challenged all of you to provide me with your favorite or perhaps scriptures that confused or confounded you. And then I based our summer preaching on those scriptures that you provided. I'm looking to repeat that again this summer. But I need the scriptures from you that for you are your favorite, those that are most important to you, or perhaps those that have always been very confusing and you would like to hear uh, explained and proclaimed. So um, again, you can email those directly to me or you can email them to the church to Janelle and she can make sure they're forwarded uh, to me. We remain closed as far as our physical space goes. We're working through the realities of what it will look like when we do open. We will only open once we have that guidelines and guidance from uh, the county and the Department of Health of what is acceptable and appropriate for us to do. We are committed to people's health and welfare and want to make sure that the most vulnerable among us can be safe when they come here, when we finally do open. I'm glad that you've chosen, though, to come and worship in this way, that you've come to be here with me in this season of resurrection when Christ comes again and again into our midst and whispers words of peace to us. I know the challenge that it is to truly open yourself to this being worship, feeling like worship, not being with other people, not inhabiting this space, but I hope that you'll open yourself to this and you would consider singing out loud and praying and standing and sitting to make it feel as though you are very much in the spirit of worship as if you were sitting here. We're doing that ourselves and we would encourage you to join with us as we do that. Let me share with you this thought for the day as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning. And this is from Beatrice of Nazareth, who was a mystic, uh, and she lived from 1200 to 1268. She said this, As a fish swims the length and breadth of the sea and rests in its depths, as a bird flies through the air, so the soul feels her mind completely unrestrained in the height, width, and depth of love.
invite you to stand and join with me in our call to worship. Let us bless our God. Let the sound of praise be heard. For God gives us life and does not let us sleep. Sure, we have been tested, caught up, and burdened, but God has been with us and has brought us through it. So let us make good on what we promised God when it was tough. Let us declare all that God has done for us, how God has listened to us and answered our prayers. Praise be to God, for God's steadfast love remains with us. shared with me recently some articles on what it's like to be a virtual church at this time, which we ourselves are experiencing. And David Brubrecker, in an article entitled When a Congregation Goes Virtual, wrote the following. Perhaps the greatest takeaway from our current virtual reality is that we were never meant primarily to attend a congregation but to be a congregation. In this crisis time, we can explore more deeply what it means to be a congregation. After all, what is a congregation but a group of human beings who congregate periodically to connect with and encourage one another 
and then to scatter once again to love and to serve, to be a congregation. And while we cannot congregate, we are finding ways, even in this virtual reality, to congregate. Whether that's joining in worship, as we are now, or whether it's in Zoom meetings, or whether it's in a myriad of other ways, we have found ways to be connected, to congregate. But the question does hang with us. What does it mean to be God's people in this time? As I've said in the past, so I continue to share the gratitude that I have for the leadership of this community of faith, for the staff of this community of faith, for the quartet, for all those who have given their time and their talents and their creativity to helping think through how we remain a congregation, how we remain connected, how we continue to offer opportunities. All are such a blessing to me, and I can't imagine going through this without them also by my side. I encourage you to continue to keep those serving in vital roles of public safety and health in your prayers. The names that we have uplifted in the past, I continue also to share with you. Scott McCutcheon, Patty Keller, John Miller, Chris Shalino, Lee, and Bill Watson. The candle on our table remains for all of those on the front lines through this time and to, for us to be mindful of them. I also share the same prayer concerns that I lifted to you last week and I just share them with you again for Barbara Burr and Sissy Mooney, both mourning the loss of their husbands to the coronavirus and Chris Clank uh, following the loss of his close cousin, Kyle Ackerman to the coronavirus. For those who have recently been hospitalized, Helen Peacock, Joe Day and Larry Burdett, Barbara Carrier, as she continues to recover following the procedure she had for David Brown's sister and for John Davis, that's Janelle Martin's future father-in-law. Patty Keller has asked us to continue to be in prayer for her very good friend's family who suffered a, a tragic loss, and so we do hold up those friends also in our hearts and prayers. I know this is never inclusive, and if there are additional joys or concerns that you would like to have shared in worship, even in this virtual time, please make sure to just email them to me or the church office, and we can make sure that they are included in, in, our, in our future worship times. Let us now turn to God in a time of prayer and uplift our joys, our concerns, and wherever you are, feel free in a time of silence to say them aloud. Let us pray. Center us now, O God, on your presence with us, wherever we are, as we lift up our heart's desires, our soul's deep needs, our hungers, our fears, our failures. As we have often failed to be obedient to your will in our lives as individual disciples, or as a congregation. We pray that you will forgive us and enliven us to be and to do the gospel of Christ. Open us to your Spirit's urgings and awaken us to live faithfully as your people in a changing, often hurting world. We pray for those around us who need your care, and ask that you would, however we can, make us instruments of your healing, peace, and redemption. We pray especially for those we have named to you this day, and others we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. 
Reveal your presence with them and with us, God of life, that as people of renewed faith and vitality, we may be empowered to serve your world and so give glory to you. For we offer our prayers and our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
with us as we prepare to hear God's word to us today. Seek out illumination in prayer first. Faithful God, who loves us in Christ Jesus, through this time of worship, send your spirit of truth to dwell within us, that we may always reject what is false, live by the commands of Christ, and be true to the love you have shown us. Grant this through Jesus Christ, the resurrection and life, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. We have three scripture readings, and the psalm, the call to worship, was based on today's psalm, which is from Psalm 66. As I have said in the past, the lectionary is a three-year cycle of scriptures that moves us through the biblical narrative almost in a complete whole. This is year A, and the passages that you have in the lectionary typically include an Old Testament, a psalm, something from one of the letters of the New Testament, so an epistle passage, and a gospel reading, something from the story of the life of Jesus. In the season of Easter, the Old Testament, however, is replaced with a reading from the story of the early church, as recorded in Acts of the Apostles. And that's where we begin this day, in the 17th chapter, and this is picking up the story in Acts with Paul before the Athenians, speaking to the Athenians. So Saul has become Paul, he's gone through his conversion, and now is an apostle out proclaiming Christ into the Gentile world. It reads there. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all, mortal, all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the place where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God was overlooked, while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. We remain in the first letter of Peter. This is in the third chapter, and so Peter continues writing there. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. 
And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> In the Gospel of John in the 14th chapter, Jesus talking to the disciples says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us take a moment. Lord God, may the meditations of my heart and mind and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. May we hear your word afresh. May it inspire us anew. In Christ I pray. Amen. Last week I talked about making sure that we begin with or have the cornerstone, the right material to build. We do that spiritually, we do that actively by resting our foundations on the cornerstone of the name of God, that great variety of ways that to know God. Our lives then become constructed, built together into a spiritual house, brick upon brick, person upon person, life upon life, way of being upon way of being. But for that house to be sturdy, you have to apply the right mortar, mortar between the bricks, between the material. 
Paul, in his address to the Athenians, as we heard from Acts of the Apostles, makes sure that we understand we're not talking about constructing physical buildings. Paul said to them in our reading that God does not live in shrines or homes, at least those made with human hands. Why? Because God has no need to, for God gives it all, and God is in it all. And yet, year after year, and generation after generation, we try and localize God in a building, in human constructed places, in altars, in symbols. We must remind ourselves of Peter's words last week from the epistle reading, come to him a living stone. And like stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house, he wrote. Not a physical house or location that is built with brawn of muscle and machine, but a spiritual home built with mercy and grace. So where is it? What does it look like? We return to what Paul says. He says, God is not far from each of us, for in God we live and move and have our being. And Jesus from our gospel reading says, you know God because God abides with you and God will be in you. Think of those words. God is not far, they say. God is present. God is in each one of us. God's image. God's house, right here. The way that we understand God is God's dwelling in community, which we call Trinity. Three essences bound together by love. So it is that God's dwelling, God's home, has found the perfect image of the divine in the community also, bound together by love. What is it to be a congregation, but to be bound together by love? And I think we might just call that the mortar, the glue between the bricks that we build our lives with. It's what holds them together. It's what holds us together. It makes us strong and capable of withstanding so much. But we're challenged. Because God did not create us to be isolated and alone. And we don't do well alone. How we all are feeling that so acutely right now. Now think again of Jesus' words, his farewell address at the close of his last meal with his disciples, which is where we are in John 14. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What are the commandments that Jesus gives? Just prior, at the end of the 13th chapter of John, Jesus says it this way, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, that's how everybody are going to know that you belong to me, that you are with me, that you are my followers, if you have love. In whatever form, What is the action, the verb, the glue, the mortar of those statements? Love. Love. The central characteristic of God. The central characteristic of those who follow God. To love God means to keep these commandments. Keeping these commandments means that one loves God. So to love Jesus and keep those commandments means living out, means becoming, means being built into a spiritual house into people, a community that's a reflection of the divine. A community bound together, connected together, glued together, mortared together. Christ is present in those who love him. Christ is visible in those who love him. This happens through our connections to one another. We are finding new ways to do that right now, to connect, to be bound together by love. That to be the church is more than just a building. It's more than just our physical gathering together. That we can still be the church and we can still connect and we can still be bound by love. It also means that we recognize that we haven't perhaps nurtured these connections as well as we could. 
we take that to God in prayer. That at times our mortar needs a little work if the house is going to remain strong. We ask through that spoken prayer and what we say in our hearts and minds to be set free, to be healed, to have that mortar repaired so that we may be more ready to love. And following that, we hear of God's amazing grace in Christ moving among us still by the power of Holy Spirit, that God's love comes to fill our holes and patch our cracks, that we may be led in connection, in love, to share with one another the peace that Christ gives. Then our connecting comes to reflect God's perfect community, community of peace, bound by and connected by love. And then God's home becomes visible among us. I know how alone we are all feeling. Maybe some of us have come praying that Jesus might be present with us, looking around and wondering where God is in the midst of all of this. If we open ourselves to God, if we through confession admit that we haven't exactly been using the right materials to hold it all together, to hold our lives together, to hold our connections together, and seek God to help us with that, then through this time we might rediscover God's presence with us. We might see the miracle of Christ coming to us, even in especially, perhaps especially in our locked down realities, whispering in our, word, in our ears words of peace and encouraging us to remain connected and committed. There's always going to be those who doubt. But if we're open to it, we will see, we will know, we will know that just as Jesus is with God, Jesus is in us, has made a home. But we can and must do so much more than worship. What are those commandments again? A key part of God's dwelling within is love of one another. And this is probably the hardest part, especially now. Peter in the epistle gives a little advice to his community, which is good advice to us. And he says, align your ways with Christ's ways, so that just as Christ showed in his life and with his life, love may also be central to yours. And in being central to yours shows that God is there, dwells there. So we go out not to take Christ to others, but through living our faith to meet Christ in others, whatever that means right now. It begins in our time together now, encountering Christ and words spoken and prayers prayed and hymns sung. We do these things and slowly we learn to recognize him in places ever more strange and foreign than a sanctuary or a church or our virtual reality. Henry Nouwen said that when we have met our Lord in the silent intimacy of our prayer, then we will also meet him in the camp, at the market, and in the town square. But when we have not met him in the center of our own hearts, we cannot expect to meet him in the busyness of our daily lives. See, there's more bricks out there <clears throat> waiting to be added to our lives, to be mortared together with us by love. As we encounter Christ through this time together, as we begin to build upon that cornerstone, we then become ready to acknowledge and celebrate the Christ wherever in whoever we encounter. See, God isn't far off. God isn't stuck way up in the clouds. God isn't some distant reality always just beyond the horizon. God, rather, is here. Not in gold or silver or stone or art or imagination, but in love, in our connection. Not love romanticized, but the real and sincere giving of self for others. Finding the ways to remain committed, connected. See, love is that process of giving with no expectation of return. 
Love is that indescribable emotion and action which is centralized down in our guts, in our bellies, in our hearts. Nothing sweeter, nothing higher, nothing wider, nothing fuller, nothing stronger, nothing better in heaven or in earth. For love is God. It knows no limits, feels no burdens, knows no bounds. As Paul wrote, love is patient and kind. It's not envious or boastful or insistent on its own ways. It endures all things. It believes all things. If we abide in love, we abide in God. This is the divine purpose to build our spiritual homes with this mortar between the bricks. To make love the reality of God's creation, which was made in love. Faith, hope, and love remain. And the greatest of these is love. Let us pray. God of all time and space, you initiated the relationship of love and generosity with creation at a time before and beyond all knowing. Through the Word and the Spirit, you continue in eternal love for all beings. Fill us with a deep and abiding awareness of your presence, your call, and your grace in our lives and in our world. Shape us into the people you have made us to be poured out in creative mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ in all creation. Amen. I would invite you now to join with me as we affirm our faith, as we let God's love abide in us and proclaim it with our lips. Stand and join with me. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Having heard God's word to us, let us respond now in our heads, in our hearts, with our lives. An offering to the church can be mailed physically to the church, or you can give online by visiting our website, ChristChurchAmherst.org, and clicking on the Give heading, which is near the top of the page. We remain committed to our vision and purpose as a congregation to make connections and offer opportunities for faith, love, and service. Your continued giving to the church allows us to see this purpose into being and is greatly appreciated. May we all now, wherever we are, lift our commitments to God at this time.
Gracious God, we lift the offerings we have made this day in our heads, our hearts, our lives. We pray that they may be a sign to you of our commitment to the greatest of these, to your never-failing love in Christ. Then what we seek, ask, we will find. And we will find that indeed a spiritual home has been built in us, through us, with us. In the name of Christ. Amen.
the embrace of the Father be the comfort you desire. May the name of the Son be the one on whom you rely. May the presence of the Spirit be with you every hour. The three in one be the focus of all you are. Amen. Thank you.